for the Red Sox over the weekend. That was in the series opener, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Trevor Story lost to a shoulder injury that feels major, for lack of a better word. Story himself used the word significant. That is where we're going to start on the baseball hour. 617-779-0985 is your number. We have you for a full hour tonight in anticipation of opening day tomorrow at Fenway Park. So I would like to add that I may touch on the 2004 Red Sox briefly at the end of this show. We'll see how that goes. But, uh, you know, I have very strong opinions as, as it relates to the 04 team. So let me just get that out of the way. I will hit on them later in the show because it's a, well, it's a day game tomorrow. So by the time we uh, get to the air here on this program, we'll have another one to talk about, another game to talk about. But there were three things I really want to hit on here at the start of the show. And let me just tell you this, Jimmy Stewart, if you ever watch uh, Scott Van Pelt on ESPN, I think he has this thing called The Best Thing I Saw Today. So I'm going to give you a variation of that on the baseball hour here tonight and tell you the most important thing that I saw this weekend, the thing that took me by the greatest surprise that I saw this weekend, and the last thing, the thing that angered me the most over the weekend. And again, we'll take your calls as well, 617-779-0985. So the biggest development of the weekend, well, no doubt there, the injury to Trevor Story. So now let me ask you this. Jimmy Stewart, let me ask you, how big a loss? How big a loss? And this, I'm asking the listeners as well. So if you're out there and you're a Trevor Story fan or you're a Red Sox fan, you're happy about the fact that you're uh, there 7-3, and three, what does this mean for the team in 2024? Where do you think it's going to go? Jimmy Stewart, how big a loss? Uh, offensively, there's no loss. You probably have a better offensive option for your lineup than Trevor Story in the three-hole. Defensively, probably a touch above average loss because Trevor Story was hyped as this great gold glove, like gets everything. He's been okay. But I feel like he's he's just somebody who makes the plays defensively that he's supposed to make, which is something that you needed. So on the scale of like loss, no loss, it's probably a break even. You can probably do about the same. It's probably zero wins above replacement or below replacement. Okay, so here's what I would say about story. And again, this really has nothing to do with the injury as it does with the overall package. And most people are going to know this because this is how I felt about story for some time. If you were to ask me, The players in Major League Baseball over the last, let's call it, I think this is Story's ninth year in the big leagues. So let's call it the last 10. I think Trevor Story's on the list. Okay, I think he is a candidate for one of the most overrated players in the game over the last 10 years. Now, again, as we've said many times on these airwaves, overrated doesn't mean suck. Would I take Trevor Story on my team? Of course. Do I like him as a player? Eh, kind of. I don't hate him as a player. But I'm not telling you, I don't think Trevor Story's an MVP candidate. I certainly don't think he's a number three hitter on your club. He would be in Worcester, though. (laughs) Which is, by the way, where the Red Sox had him batting is in that three spot. Trevor Story's not a number three hitter. Not at Fenway Park. Not at any park other than Colorado. Is it still Coors Field? Do they still call it Coors Field? Sure. I have no idea, so I, you know... I can't keep track of how frequently they change the names of ballparks. But outside of Coors Field, he's a 237 career hitter with an OPS. His OPS as a member of the Red Sox is under 700. It's in the 680s. His defense is good. I wouldn't call it otherworldly. He's not the best defensive shortstop I've ever seen. Although people around here now seem to talk about him that way. He's a pretty good player offensively, and I heard Tyler Milliken say this today on the Midday Program, uh, Trevor Story is average. OPS plus, if you understand that stat, some of you don't. I don't blame you. It basically rates you against the field. 100 is average. Trevor Story comes in at, over the last three years, Trevor Story comes in at 103. Alex Verdugo, over that same period of time, comes in at 101. So again, just think of it in those terms. In terms of grading him against the average, both are a tick above. Trevor Story and and Alex Verdugo, based on the analytics, are similar players. Uh, Story gets a very slight edge, but they're similar players. 
I think on a good team, Trevor Story's in the top two spots in the lineup, or he's down in the seven, seven area, six or seven. That's what I think he is. So if that guy is taking down your team, you're not very good. So I don't think this should sink their season. Again, I'll take Story on my team. When he's out there, he plays hard. Hasn't been out there a lot. He's played fewer games in his Red Sox career than Xander Bogarts played last season for the Padres. And Bogarts had a down year, but his OPS, 790. Trevor Story in his Red Sox career, under 700 is closer to 680. So that's number one. Number two, the Sedan Raphael extension. And there were reports today that the Red Sox have agreed to an extension with Sedan Raphael. The details of the extension have not been released or reported. What I would like to know from you out there is, am I the only one who's surprised by this? And is Sedan Raffaella the kind of guy that I have to extend for 40, guys in, 40 games into his big league career? So if Tristan Casas had been signed to some sort of significant deal, I might feel differently. Now, and Casas has been in the big leagues for over a year, and I am certain that Tristan Casas is a big leaguer. Sedan Raffaella? I have no idea. Why exactly did the Red Sox have to sign this contract? And again, I haven't seen the value, so I'm sure from their standpoint, it's a good deal. But if this makes you feel good, I don't really understand why. Because I don't know that Sedan Raphael is ever going to hit. If he didn't produce, he wasn't going to be the kind of guy that got huge numbers in arbitration. Jimmy, why are you raising your hand? Uh, because I have the numbers on the contract. Oh, please Raphael. go. Eight years, $50 million. Holy smokes. Eight years, $50 million? What was Bayo, Jimmy? Do you remember? Wasn't he six years and 50? I thought it was six and 50. Okay, so again, Raffaella, eight and 55. And again, the 55 isn't the number that alarms me. I just don't understand why you had to go out of your eight way. Eight and 50. Eight and 50 for Raffaella. I just don't understand why you had to go out of your way to commit eight years to Sedan Raffaella. I'm still not sure he can play in the big leagues. I like him, but I don't know if he can hit. He might be nothing more than a utility guy. We'll see. He's got power. And this is going to send some people into orbit when I mention this. You know who he reminds me a little of, Jimmy Stewart? And you know because I put it in the notes I sent you before the show. So some of you will remember this guy. Some of you won't. It goes way back. We're talking 25 years now. But guy with a similar build, probably even a little smaller than Raffaella, who was fast and could play defense, even had a little bit of power. Donnie Sadler. Ugh. The Red Sox had a utility guy named, and he was a you know a prospective center fielder, middle infielder slash uh, center fielder who could run like the Dickens, had some power, ultimately couldn't hit. His name was Donnie Sadler, and fans loved him. He was 5'6", a buck 65, Tony. Okay, how big's Raphael? A 5'9"? Maybe 5'9"-ish. Okay, so they, they weren't, they're not that different, and I would argue that um, Sadler was stronger than Raphael. But, again, either... Well, Sadler had a different <clears throat> training program. Well, that could be. I mean, it's neither here nor there. But again, it just doesn't feel like the kind of guy to me that you have to go out of your way to lock up. Uh, And at the end of the day, not a big deal. The money's not prohibitive. Although if the Red Sox end up cutting payroll and they have 7.6 million committed to Donnie Sadler for the next eight years, that's money that you get to count on your payroll now. I'll give you the third thing later. It's the thing that pissed me off the most. It doesn't really relate to the Red Sox um, specifically, but it does... There are members of the Red Sox who have uh, been involved in it. Let me put it that way so I don't give it away. Uh, but let's go to Justin and Shrewsbury. Justin, what do you got? Hey, man. Thanks for taking the call. Um, so with uh, two points, uh, so with, um, with Story going out, do you think that kind of like propels uh, Marcelo Meyer a little bit coming up through the system? And then I also want to touch on the series with the Orioles coming up. This is kind of their first like true test of the whole season. And, you know, last year the Orioles were the cream of the crop in the East, and, you know, they're kind of looking to build on that momentum. And other than that, like, up until, like, April, they really have a soft schedule. So if the Red Sox can have a good record coming out of April, they can keep the 
hot, hot start going and kind of keep it going. Justin, you know, yeah, Justin, before I let you go, do you want Meyer up here, Marcelo Meyer? I mean, probably not yet, but, I mean, I know he's, like, still really young, isn't he, in, like, double A, so I don't, I don't kind of want to, you know, kind of expedite that too fast. I kind of want to let him develop before just throwing him onto the big league roster. Okay. I want to go about it the right way. Okay, too early. Too early on Meyer. Now, again, if the circumstances were different, I would sit here and tell you, fine, no problem. But let me specify to you what those circumstances are. So, first of all, Meyer got to double A last year. He tore up A ball. He got a quick promotion to double A. And then he got hurt. So his numbers at double A were poor before the injury. Then he got hurt, played worse. They shut him down. It was over. He had shoulder surgery. Now, in spring training, he reported that he was feeling as healthy as he's felt in a long time. We all know that Marcelo Meyer was the number four pick in the draft, I think it was, a couple of years ago. There's great promise for him, all of which is justified based on where he was draft, drafted. B- but I-, I will also tell you that he hasn't played for over half a season, basically. He was bad at double A when he got there and needs more time. On top of that, and this is an important point to me, the Red Sox are hardly in a position where they can ask one of their top prospects to come up when he's not ready, ask him to play defense and do the best he can while they figure out a solution without putting him at risk. And by that, I mean the team's not good enough. So if you bring up Meyer now, what becomes the story? And it's Meyer's play. It's not the the plight of the team or the team making the playoffs or any of that because the Red Sox aren't good enough. If they were, they wouldn't have tickets available for opening day because you'd be buying them. So don't sit here and tell me that you think they're good enough because you don't. And I'm talking to you as a collective. You don't. The worst thing to do would be to introduce him into an environment where people expect him to be the savior. Especially when he missed half the year at double A where he has sucked. And again, that doesn't mean I think he sucks as a player. I'm just saying the timing's bad. Bad. They, if they had believed in this team, they would have spent on it, and they would have had Meyer in the shoot, and they would say, you know what, we can bring him up. He can play defense here. We'll put him at the bottom of the lineup. We'll see how it goes. If he really struggles, we'll send him back, and we can make a quick determination. They're in no position to do that. I think it would be a huge mistake to bring him up right now. Tony, the other thing about Mayer is now we're finding out why he dropped from the consensus number one overall pick and Ben Charrington, who was drafting for the Pirates, said, no, no, we're going with this other kid, Henry Davis, who's in the big leagues right now. And a shortstop, uh, Jordan Lawler, was on the National League champion Diamondbacks. He went at six. So... Mayor looks like a bust. Well, Sorry to say, Red Sox Yeah, fans. look again, and Jimmy, I'm, I'm not going to call him a bust yet because it's early. Oh, I will. Injury prone, uh, isn't hitting at the double-A level, high pick, high prospect. He should be here already. There are already other players from that draft who are in the big leagues right now. He should be here with all the hype that was behind him. He should be up here replacing instead of David Hamilton. Come on. So there you go. That's how Jimmy Stewart feels about Marcelo Meyer. And there's another lesson in there, too. Whether you think Meyer can play or not, what if he can't? He can't. Then what? Then you let Bogarts go. You signed an injury-prone Trevor Story, and you still don't have a shortstop? And you blew the pick. 617-779-0985. We'll get to your calls. And uh, I will also tell you about the thing that did make me most angry over the weekend. We'll touch on that when we come back on the Baseball Hour. This is the Baseball Hour with Tony Mez. Gain the know-how to become a successful leader at Babson College. The-
Yeah. It's Trevor Story, post game on Friday night. After the injury, Red Sox ended up holding on to win that game. They lost on Saturday. We'll get to some of the issues with the team uh, hopefully later in the show. But the the you know the story um, development is a look. It's a significant blow. I don't want to tell you it isn't. I mean, you lost a guy who's a, one of your regular players. Where the Red Sox were playing him, meaning or batting him, and the number three spot in the lineup is a big ask, even if he's healthy. I don't think he's a number three hitter. I really don't think he's anything all that close. So to me, he's at best like a six hitter. I, I would put him at seven on a championship caliber team. Uh, and maybe maybe six. Maybe you could get away with that. Or, or first or second in the lineup. But in the heart of the order, no. That's select company there. He's not that kind of guy. So that being said, I think the Red Sox can overcome it. Uh, tell you what, let me take a couple of calls, then I'll add in the thing that bugged me uh, the most over the weekend. Uh, Nick in Providence. Nick, go ahead. Hey, Tony, what's going on? So the first thing I just want to say is that Rafael money is so annoying to me because what, what about Snell? What about Montgomery? What about the actual needs that you had over the past few uh, weeks to months with this team? But anyways, the reason I called was for story. Uh, a lineup like this that has five or six major leaguers to begin with, losing <clears throat> excuse me, losing one of those major leaguers is a problem. That's a loss. I'm sorry. I agree. Trevor Story isn't all that. And I was pissed that they chose him over Xander Bogarts. You had the best hitter with silver sluggers in consecutive years at the position, and you had to go for this guy. I, it, it's a loss for this team. As much as I hate to say it, I mean, they, they were maybe a 75-76 win team before. Now they're going to be, what, a 70-71 win team? I mean, on a bad team, he helps. It, this is going to go downhill fast. I don't think it's going to get better with him out. So, Nick, you think it's going to take him down? Uh, the team, yes, I do. I don't. I don't. Because, again, and look, maybe this is just splitting hairs because it sounds like you agree with me on some level. If Trevor Story's your number three hitter, you're not that good. So you were going to go down anyway. Now, I would say in the same breath, and Felger said this during the, uh, the uh, show earlier today, and I, I sort of have a similar uh, sentiment. The people that want to say, oh, now they're screwed, because I think that was the initial reaction when Story got hurt. Ah, now they're screwed. Just want to give up, want to give them an excuse. And I, I just don't think offensively Trevor Story is a number three hitter. In fact, I think they're better off with Tyler O'Neill hitting third. I don't think he's a number three hitter uh, either, but I think he's a better hitter than Trevor Story. I think his ceiling is higher than Trevor Story's. And when I say that, I don't mean that I think that uh, he's a completely better player. But I think that Tyler O'Neill could probably hit 265 with 35 home runs, and I'm not sure uh, Trevor Story can hit anything better than about 235 outside of Colorado. I've seen Tyler O'Neill hit 34 home runs. I mean, you know, I know he's his by reading his stat line, but the point is there's evidence that he can hit 34 home runs outside of Colorado. I'm not sure there is for uh, Trevor Story. So, I, you know, to me, Put O'Neill in there. You got to figure out the defense for sure. I don't want to minimize that. Uh, Quinn in Arlington. Quinn, go ahead. Hey, man. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this because it feels like ever since Dustin Pedroia got hurt, they've been platooning second base. And now with Trevor Story out, it seems like they're going to have to platoon the entire middle infield. And when the message in the offseason was we didn't make the playoffs because of our defense, uh, it just rubs, it just rubs me the wrong way. So I, I really hope they figure it out and do something with it. But uh, yeah, that's my take. Okay, Thanks, guys. Look, yeah, look, you should be worried about the defense, and there's lots of potential solutions. So I'll tell you what, let's rattle off a few of them quickly here. One is that you put Sedan Raffaella at short and move him in from center field. I don't like it. Now again, I want to see Raffaella play shortstop because I haven't seen him play a lot of it, and I certainly haven't seen a lot of it in the big leagues. And with young players, they get better. For example, David Hamilton looks better to me now than he did a year ago. That doesn't mean I want him there every day. But after he booted the first ball yesterday, and I say booted, it was hit 112 miles an hour at him. But even so, it was a play story would have made. Hamilton on the next two plays looked a little bit better. Last year, he looked like a guy that couldn't throw. 
He looked a little more fluid there yesterday. He hit a home run. He can run. I don't know. Let me see. Can they get 60 games out of him? And then someone else gives him 60? I've also seen Vaughn Grissom theorize. He played shortstop in the Braves system. He's going to come back and play second base. I don't think he can do it. There's a reason why the Braves moved him. So, now, I'm not even sure he can play second base. Based on some of the reports that were out there and some of the, you know, the theories on his defense to begin with. Again, I will defer judgment on all these guys until we see him play. How about just picking a guy up? Two years ago, three years ago, the Red Sox picked up Jose Iglesias late in the year for nothing off of waivers and played him at second base. With short stops, with middle infielders, you typically can find guys that can play defense. Can Pablo Reyes do it for 30 games? Or 60? I don't know. The bat, to, uh, you know, uh, to me, again, is a number seven bat in the lineup, and he is an everyday player, so you lose something. I'm not telling you you don't lose something. You do. But it's not like saying you're losing your number three hitter like you lost would have lost David Ortiz 15 years ago. They're just not that kind of team anymore. What about Von Grisham at shortstop? So I, I did just mention oh, that, I'm sorry. Jimmy. That's okay. No, no, I did mention that. That, again, the Braves let him go because he couldn't play He sucked there. at defense. Right? So... I mean, is it possible? Sure. Because yeah. he should be ready for tomorrow for opening day. But if you put Von Grissom at short, then that means Emmanuel Valdez is your second baseman. I mean, you're porked either way because right. Pablo Reyes can't play every day, according to Alex Cora. So, you know, there, there are lots of openings there. But my point is, spend a little money, poke around, claim someone off of waivers. You should be able to figure it out. And you're going to have to get the offense from Tyler O'Neill because you were short on right-handed batters to begin with. And make sure your manager likes the player that you get, unlike last year because of uh, Heim Bloom getting Pablo Reyes and the manager th- doesn't think he can play every day. So, and again, but th- right now I'm not even sure you need an everyday guy. It might be musical chairs. Who the hell knows? But can can the combination of people you put there, can they all go out and just play functional shortstop where your defense is average? It might be enough. Doubt it. Stephen Fall Rivers, Steve, go. You can't. I can't let this guy say what he said about he wants Xander Bogarts for three hundred thirty million dollars. This guy hit three hundred seven with fifteen home runs and seventy three RBIs. For him. Steve, just real quick, who are you talking about? Xander Bogarts. No, you who cannot... said that? Who said that? You two callers ago, Tony said they should have signed Bogarts and not Story. Story's making half the price. I called you, and you might have forgotten the last week to tell you you were ra- ragging on him. You didn't let me tell you what else I said. I told people he's worth 10 games this year over last year's total just being in the field. What did you tell me? He's hit 234. He's in the third spot. That's not what they're missing from this guy. He, just because this knuckle has got him in the third spot isn't what's the mid- value of Trevor's story. It's at shortstop, look at the grimace that the third baseman had when he watched him go down. Who made an error two days later cost him a game? The third baseman, because this guy's in the middle and giving confidence to the third baseman, Trevor Story, and he makes the middle of the lineup better. You have to bring the center fielder in and take your shot in center field. You have to shore up the middle of this lineup. Trevor, Steve, I'm going to let you go just because I, I, I just – sometimes I think this stuff gets a little crazy. You want to tell me that Trevor Story makes Raphael better as a better defensive player because he's got better range and Devers doesn't have to range as far? No problem. I'll buy in on that. You want to tell me that Trevor Story makes Raphael Devers a better defensive player because he increases his confidence? How? That play that Devers effed up the other night – was a basic play. That's got nothing to do with confidence. Zero. That's a soft bouncer to the left side that had some spin on it. Devers didn't have to move far for that ball. It was right at him. He effed it up because he gets lazy. Period. And he did it last year when Story was next to him, at least for part of the year. So does Story shore up the middle? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But now all of a sudden, he's going to turn Raphael Devers into a better player? Raphael Devers has had lapses in third base almost every year of his career. Two years ago, when he was in a contract year, his focus was better, coincidentally. So again, I just it's these leaps that people make sometimes that I don't get. So now again, 
story as an everyday big league shortstop. Yes, capable. Good, good defensive player. People are now talking about him like he's Ozzie Smith or Omar Vizquel or pick whatever shortstop you want who's one of the greats in the game. He's not. He's never won a gold glove. He got attention in Colorado as silver sluggers because he hit in Colorado. So whether you want to believe it or not, Trevor's story is a little overrated, maybe a lot. Your season should not go down the toilet because you lost Trevor's story. It's no excuse. So what, we're just going to write it off now because story's gone? Yep. <laughs> the season was over with or without Trevor's story based on you know $200 million payroll and a bunch of suck players. Boy, you guys all want to give up at the littlest bit of adversity then. Like well, blame I, the guy who runs the Red Sox. He didn't want to make the big move. Like, I'm mad at the Red Sox because they have this seven-win start, and had they added another starter, another right-handed hitter, maybe that's a nine-win start, but a seven-win start is pretty good. Now you need to lengthen both your pitching staff and your lineup out, and they chose not to do that. They chose to reduce payroll instead of add payroll. Jimmy, your frustrations with ownership and the spending and management, all that is legit. Okay, it's legit. I would also tell you, you're 10 games into the season, you're 7-3, and three, and everyone just wants to stop playing? Let's just stop and cancel the season. Every, let's just stop. Let's quit because it got hard. Giolito went down. Now Story Guys is getting too hard. Let's just quit. So I, I can't do that. Well, that's what they did last year too, by the way. I, I can't do that. Find a way. We have a show to do for the rest until October at least. Find, find a way. And you know what? The pitchers have been good so far. So for the most part, find a way. Maybe if the pitching can live up to its potential, you can hang in there. Or cheat more. That works. And then see where you are at the end of July, and maybe you can trade for a shortstop then. You don't have to hang in it for six months. You just got to hang in it for about three and figure it out. Uh, Kevin Majority has got your headlines. I keep telling you, I want to, there was something that really pissed me off over the weekend. We'll get to that as well when we come back. Sports Hub Headlines.
that kind of guy. Number six hitter, end of story. What if he get him in a great year and he hits 270 with 35 bombs? Could he be your number three hitter by default? So I get some issues with the Red Sox in the early part of the year. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really about wins and losses. And Tyler O'Neill has been a godsend. Although, I, Jimmy, I, I said this earlier today, five home runs, five RBI. That is hard to do. That is, that is hard to do. So we'll get back to your calls. Let me just add this quickly because I keep teasing it. What pissed me off the most over the weekend actually happened late in the week, but it got a little more attention over the weekend, which is the MLB Players Association, the union, the MLBPA, blaming the pitch clock for the number of injuries that are taking place with pitchers throughout the game. Let's blame the pitch clock. You freaking babies, you disingenuous babies. And I don't mean the players, although I mean some of them. I mean more the union officials. That is shameful. You're going to blame the pitch clock? What, because you didn't have a say in the rule? It's the pitch clock? Let me ask you a question. Jimmy uh, Stewart or anyone else out there, has anyone in the history of game ever thrown 110 miles an hour? Not to my knowledge. I think 105 was the high watermark for Chapman. Very good, Jimmy. And you know why nobody's ever thrown 110 miles an hour? I don't. Because the arm can't handle it. Oh. The human arm can't handle it. That's why. And you know what happens to people who just try to throw the ball as hard as possible or spin it like the Dickens? Their arms explode. So what's going on in the game now? Everybody, every organization and every player, the players are complicit, by the way. They want to throw harder. They want to spin it more. So you know what happens? Their arms blow out. And we're going to blame the freaking pitch clock? Oh, that is shame. That's low. That is low. Let's blame the pitch clock for the injuries because that was the owner's choice, and that way we can exempt ourselves from any blame. Let's blame someone else for something when there's a little opening to do it, even though we don't believe it. Because that's what I think the union's doing. And by the way, I'm not pro-owner. I'm not pro-union. But that, when it comes to baseball, and in fact, most things, but I will tell you, that is an embarrassment. That is a freaking embarrassment on the part of the Players Association. Shameless or shameful. I don't know which or both. That's pathetic. And Nick Pavetta and Kenley Jansen were among those who complained about it, So, which is part of the reason I say the Red Sox are at least partly involved in this story. Would you stop? Would you stop? It's just whining. The whining is unbelievable in the finger-pointing from the union, even when they don't believe it, just to get their constituency in a lather. Shameful. Jordan in Boston. Jordan, go ahead. I just think the beginning of the season is really a facade. Like, our pitching's been going five, six innings every time. If we actually added a legit starter and pushed everyone down the rotation one, I think maybe it's a different story. But I'm not going to give them too much credit for beating the Oakland A's and the Angels so far. So, Yeah, Jordan, you shouldn't give them credit. But I will say this. You know, the, the pitching's been okay. Bayo hasn't been great. Bayo wasn't great in the first game either. He just got away with it. And Whitlock threw 101 pitches in four and a third innings the other night. So they're not 10 for 10. The guy who's been the best so far is their number five starter, if you're going by the numbers. Houck. Houck's been good both times out. He's not given up a run. But four of the five have an ERA under one. Bayo is the only one who's over 1.0. So, so far, they've been okay. And I was just saying Bob Beers is here uh, with Judd Surratt. They have a, a special hockey show coming up at 7 o'clock. And I just said to Bob Beers, their pitchers have talent. I don't know if any of them is what I would call a, an intimidating you know, front-line ace. But they have talent. They're all capable. Your pitching could keep you in it if they all stay healthy and pitch to their potential, which is a huge if. I just don't know if they can do it. Martin on uh, Martin in Texas. Martin, go ahead. 
Hey, Tony, I think uh, now that they've paid Rafael, though, it sounds a long-term contract. It shouldn't really matter in the situation, but uh, it should just depend on how long he's going to be out. If Trevor Story is only going to be on the 15-day IL, then just roll with the fill-ins you have. And if he's going to be out long-term, give yourself a competent infield defender and make the outfield work with the guys you have because it will at least be average in that respect. So, Martin, look, again, I'm reluctant to move Raffaella from center field, but if, you, if you're going to tell me that he can play shortstop the way he plays center field, then my answer is okay, I'll do it. It's a more important position, no question about it, and you can get away without great defense in center field. You know, that Johnny Damon was not a great center fielder, neither was Jacoby Ellsbury, and you won championships with those guys. So you can certainly do it with other, other players in center field. Now, I don't know if, you know, I'd have to think about who I'd want out there. But if he can play shortstop the same way, sure, fine, I'm with you. I'm just not sure he can. I need to see more of it. I haven't seen enough of him at short to know. Jeff's in Boston. Jeff, go ahead. Hey, Maz. Um, and I got to disagree with Martin here. I, I'm out on moving Raffaella to, uh, to short um, just because we saw what happened when we tried moving Kike from center field to short and, Took an elite defender out there, and we all thought Kike could play shortstop until he couldn't. So I'm just worried about that happening again. But um, my other point, too, just quickly on Jaron Duran, really um, impressed with what I've seen so far with him, especially against fastballs. I know that wasn't a strong part of his game uh, in the last couple of years, but he turned around a 99-mile-per-hour fastball on Friday and just crushed it to center field. So really like what I've seen from him so far. So, look, Jeff, he's been one of their better players here in the early part of the year as well. He and O'Neill, I think, have been their two best offensive players. And the amazing thing to me about Duran is he's hitting like 357, and he still strikes out a crap ton. So usually the guys that strike out a lot hit for lower average. They just don't make contact, and they hit a crap ton of home runs. He is more of a high average guy who strikes out a lot. It, it's, it's paradoxical. It's weird. But whatever it is, it works. And, uh, you know, when he's, to me, he's at his best when he's hitting the ball the other way. Uh, that I like. So he's dynamic on the bases. You know, he's fun to watch run. Not always the smartest base runner, but nonetheless, you know, he's uh, entertaining and he's been, uh, you know, slashing the ball all over the field. So hard to not like what Duran has given them. In left field, he's a good fit. Center field, he still worries me. We'll wrap it up your, uh, with your calls when we come back. And I do want to touch on that 4 team quickly because I looked up some numbers again today that will make your eyes pop out of your head. We'll get to that next. Stay tuned for more of the Baseball Hour on the Sports Hub.
Red Sox pitching has been good so far. That guy's been the best. Tanner how terrific again. Hasn't given up a run yet this season. Somebody out of that group has to pop. Somebody. Ideally, two of the three. And by the three, I mean Bayo, Houck, and uh, who am I leaving out? Whitlock. Whitlock. Uh, let me take a call quickly, and then I'll give you my thoughts on the 4 team, which will be honored tomorrow. Go ahead, Jim. What do you got? Maz, tomorrow's opening day. Let's think positive. Um, we're off to a good start, 7-3. and three. What will it take to have the ownership who refuses to invest? What would it take? What type of a stat would it take where they're almost forced to spend money on this team? Well, so, Jim, I wouldn't hold your breath as it pertains to this season. I mean, all the chances to spend the big money, you're gone. Anything you do from here, here on out would probably be a trade. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get a big money guy, but you'd have to give up prospects, and I don't see them doing that. Now, you could take on a contract at the deadline to get another guy, so something like that. But to me, you know, you're going to have to wait until next offseason. Here's what you should hope for if you want them to spend again. That all of a sudden, somehow, these young guys start performing. And I'm talking about the pitchers now. Whitlock, Hauk, Bayo, uh, Raffaella hits at a reasonable level and can play a whole season in the big leagues as a regular. Casas hits. You know, and then all of a sudden you're in a spot where the team's uh, con- contending for a playoff spot. Now they feel like a couple of moves will put them over the top and get them back to the level that we're accustomed to seeing. And, you know, maybe Meyer shows up here at the end of the year or Kyle Teal shows up at the end of the year. You get a little glimpse of him. He competes for a job in camp. And now here you go. That's what you have to hope for. Quickly, before we go, let me just tell you, the 4 team will be on, uh, honored tomorrow. I may do more on this later in the week. I wanted to give it a little more time than I'm about to give it tonight. Uh, the 4 Red Sox are the best Red Sox team I've ever seen, bar none, including the, the 2018 team that won 108 games. I take the 4 team every single time over them. By the time the – now, I do think there's a psychological element that came into play meaning that by the time the 18 Red Sox came along, they didn't have to deal with the burden of that uniform and of having gone 100 years without a world championship. It was actually 86, but work with me. I looked it up today. At the end of the regular season, in their final uh, 32 and 12, 44 games, the Red Sox went 32 and 12. 32 and 12. In those 44 games, they were a plus 81 in run differential. To give you an idea, that that is basically for a season, plus 300. That would blow out of the water by 20 runs what the Atlanta Braves did last year. They were a freaking machine. And I want to do something more in depth on this on our website. But that team, if there's any team in Boston sports history that deserves your respect, it's the 2004 Red Sox. What they had to overcome to win was unlike anything maybe that any team has done with the possible exception of the 2001 Patriots. Jimmy, you got something? And Maz, the key to that 04 Red Sox team was they could beat you in any way that they needed to beat you. And the World Series sweep over the Cardinals is the perfect example. They beat the Cardinals in game one, 11 to nine. And I think they won the rest of the games like three, one, four, one. Like, that's how dominant they were, is they could just beat you any way in possible blowouts, close high-run scoring games, low-run scoring games, all of it. They were just elite. Best team I've ever seen in my life. You name the game, they'll win it. You name it, they'll win it. Anyway, top of the hour. Uh, Jimmy, do we have a break here? Has Majori got headlines here? Oh, yeah, he's got headlines for you. Okay, Kevin Majori's got headlines. Judd Surratt and Bob Beers in studio. We're in studio appearance for Judd Surratt and Bob Beers.